Hello everyone. Today's topic will be the rock cycle. But before I get into that, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about my videos. This is probably going to be the last geophiles of the season. We've got a lot of stuff to do. But most of you know my videos tend to be very technical. And my target audience is more adult oriented, you know, young adults to senior citizens, people who have a casual to more than casual interest in geology and for professionals as well. I do that because it's a niche that I think is not well explored. You can go anywhere on the internet and find basic background information and videos targeted towards children. And that's fine. I don't mind that at all. I'm not dinging that at all. That's just, you know, completely filled along with topics people find very blingy in geology. So the thing about geology is, unless you're interested in rocks and how the earth formed in its history, but you don't know enough about it, most people don't care about it. Uh, you know, you might find people that find fossils interesting, but very few people look at a sandstone from the Precambrian and go, oh yeah, that's interesting. That's where I come in. It's to show you that the world has a much grander history and the processes involved in shaping it are far more complex than just simple 101 classes. I know people who think geologists just look at rocks all day and identify them. That's not it, all right? There's far more to that. But this episode will be a lot easier to understand for most people, as long as you understand basic geology. This is essentially gonna be a little bit more than a 101 class because there's some stuff I think that needs to be added to videos pertaining to the rock cycle that I think is usually glossed over uh, just for simplicity and time restraints. So that being said, let's get started. What is the rock cycle? Well, first we need to define what a rock is. I have done that in other videos. I'm not gonna do it here, but basically a rock is an aggregate of one or more minerals, all right? We're just gonna keep it there. I know that doesn't apply across the board. I understand that, all right? So in minerals, same thing, oversimplistic definition here, are inorganic crystalline substances and they're solid. So in order to be a rock, you have to be made of minerals and those stick to that definition. Now I am going to talk about exceptions to that. Now, as we all know, it's not that simple, but I don't want to get down any rabbit holes here with you in this video. And it's not just a simple cycle like this. There's sub cycles and there's things in the rock cycle that are not rocks, but are important to the development of rocks. And even though we call it a cycle, it's not cyclical in the time sense. It's not like you can go from one rock to another rock, to another rock, to another rock. This takes a hundred thousand years. This takes a million. This takes five million. It's not like that. And the rocks don't have to go in a nice cycle. You'll see here what I'm talking about. All right. It's, it's a complex subject that I could really do a whole series on if I really wanted to, but we're gonna keep it simple. Okay, before I get into the cycle part, I need to show you what some things are, define some things. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is melt, molten lava or magma as people are familiar with, but most of us geologists now call it melt because the only difference between a magma and a lava is that a magma forms underground, a lava is spilled up onto the surface. Now, to throw a wrench into all that, we also call the solidified version of lava a lava flow. <laughs> so that's why I tend not to use that term. I try to say melt. But if you hear me say lava or magma, I'm talking about a melted rock, okay? That's the first one. The second thing I need to talk about is sediment, detrital sediment. Now in lithostratigraphy, it is irrelevant if a rock unit, which has a different definition than the rock, is consolidated or not. We're gonna talk about rocks being consolidated for all intents and purposes here, but sediment can be considered a rock unit as well because it has a potential to become sedimentary rock. And sediment could be really thick. And I'm going to refer to sediment as detritus, just to separate it from sedimentary rock to not confuse you. All right. So sediments are part of loose sediment is part of the rock cycle, but technically it's not one of our three main types of rocks. I've already touched on one. 
So we'll start with that, sedimentary. We're gonna dive a little deeper into this, but we'll start simply first. A sedimentary rock is a rock that is derived from other sediments, all right? And has been lithified, okay? Just stick with that right now. The second major rock type is igneous. Igneous rocks cool from melts. I've already talked about melts. And our third type of rock is metamorphic. Metamorphic rocks generally form, there's exceptions to this, but you know, we're not gonna go into that. But they generally form through heat and pressure, but they don't melt again. Because if you melt, you are no longer a rock, you're a melt. And if you recrystallize, then you're an igneous rock. So keep that in mind. And there's a certain type of metamorphic rock called a migmatite that a lot of geologists would like to pull out as a fourth classification of rock, but most of us just consider them metamorphic. So it's, it's not really something you need to concern yourself with because they're very complex, but being really simple. And what I mean by that is lithologically, you know, lithology, the, the makeup of them is pretty simple. It's easy to pick out the minerals. What's complex is the history. And I've touched on this before with metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks that are formed from things like sedimentary rocks, depending on the grade of metamorphism, you can lose those initial structures. But let's get into the actual cycle itself. It really has no beginning and really has no end. And we're gonna talk about these rocks as conditions on Earth today. I'm not worried about a billion years from now. I'm not gonna address four billion years ago. But we have to start somewhere with this cycle. So I'm just gonna start with a melt. And like I said, I've already talked about this. Basically, you know, your melt is derived from any type of rock that has experienced enough heat to melt. Now, there's other things that can lower melting temperature in a rock, like water. So like on tectonic plate boundaries, as a plate dives into the mantle, it might bring some water with it. As that pressure is increased, the melting temperature lowers and you can generate a melt. So let's move on to the next part. Our melt is already in place, either on the surface or underground, it doesn't matter. And it starts to crystallize, it starts to cool. So we get our igneous rock. Now, in order to be a rock, you have to be made of minerals, which are made of crystals in this application as we're talking about it. So our igneous rock has now formed from our melt. And this particular picture here is of what's called the Rapakivi granite. And it's a petrologist's nightmare because we still can't explain these things. And I picked it because I think it's cool. When you look at uh, feldspars in granitic rocks, usually the plagioclase is to the center and the alkali feldspar is on top. These are flipped, the alkali feldspar is in the middle and it has plagioclase rings. That's a bit of an enigma, but it's a cool one. And it looks kind of granular. I mean, if I just showed you this picture of this Rapakivi granite, and if, you know, you might think it's a conglomerate or something like that, all right? And it's not, it cools from a melt. And we can determine these things in the lab. We can melt rocks and watch what minerals form, like Bones Reaction Series, which I've talked about before. So I'm not going to get into it again. But you can look at it here if you want to. So now our igneous rock is either already at the surface or has been exposed to the surface. And it starts weathering. Erosion takes place. Now, on the surface of the Earth, you basically have physical and chemical weathering, right? Physical weathering is the mechanical breakdown of the rock. You know, it's a, it, you know, think of it this way. You take a rock and you're hitting it with a hammer and you just get smaller rocks. That's basically physical weathering, but under natural conditions. Now you can chemically weather into other things. As a matter of fact, granites on earth, the feldspars I talked about get chemically weathered and eventually will become clays. Clays, and like the picture here, sand, are what we call clastic rocks, and so are conglomerates. These are rocks formed from the weathering of other materials. But other things can happen, and let's get into the next rock type first, all right? Now from here, I can go one of two ways with this. We have our detritus, let's leave that there. 
Let's go back to our igneous rock. Notice that we've got arrows going in multiple directions. Say our igneous rock stays buried underground or becomes deeply buried through sediments being put on top of it or other lava flows or whatever, and that heat and pressure on the rock is increased or in an orogenic mountain building event through plate collisions, what can happen to that igneous rock is it can undergo metamorphism and become a metamorphic rock. Now there's technical metamorphic facies, but I'm not going to talk about those. Just think of metamorphism as low, medium, and high grade. Low grade metamorphic rocks when we start to see basic recrystallization, and when mud rocks like shales, which are derived from clays, become metamorphosed, you get a change in minerals. New minerals are formed. You can get new minerals forming without melting the rock. And then it undergoes more heat and pressure and a different set of minerals will form. Now, if you're going from igneous to metamorphic in this case, the only thing you're really going to notice in the field about the difference between low, medium, and grade metamorphism is what we call banding in the metamorphic rock. It, it means the minerals become aligned. Foliation. All right. But under unique circumstances, a magma or melt that's slowly cooling under deep underground can look granitic in one part and gneissic in another. And gneiss is a type of metamorphic rock. Now, gneisses will form from any of the other three rocks if they experience enough heat and pressure. Igneous, sedimentary, and other metamorphic rocks. And metamorphic rocks can be derived from other metamorphic rocks, making it a big cycle because, like I said, it can go from low, medium, to high, and we can even have retrograde metamorphism. So you can have a cycle within the metamorphic cycle, so I didn't add it here as anything special. All right, so I think I'm going to leave that there from now. Remember, you can always leave questions in the comments if I'm not being clear enough. Now, how our igneous rock experienced erosion and weathering, our metamorphic rock can too as well. If our metamorphic rock is created underground through heat and pressure and lifted back up through a mountain building or orogenic event, it can undergo chemical and physical weathering just like an igneous rock to become detritus or sediment. All right? I keep talking about this detritus and the sediment and all this, but what happens if that loose sediment becomes lithified, becomes hardened into rock? Well, you get sedimentary rock. This is of the Jacobsville group. It's a sandstone, Precambrian, Neoproterozoic. Near the end, the Precambrian. And sandstones are some really common sedimentary rocks. They're not the most common, but they're pretty common. And we like these, at least I do, because mineralogy is easy to see under magnification. But sandstones are not the only type of sedimentary rock you can get through erosion, weathering, and lithification. You can take clays, like I've said, and silt, and they can become mudstones, which become siltstones or shales. Or, like I've already shown you, oh wait. Here's a rock that's got some shale around it. I've shown you guys this before. This is a special type of rock, but this is formed in a sedimentary unit older than the sandstone I showed you but you can see that they tend to be laminated and stuff like that. Sandstones, conglomerates, mudstones, your siltstones and shales are your clastic sedimentary rocks. And those are formed from the weathering and erosion, physical breakdown of rocks. Now I mentioned chemical weathering before. Chemical weathering can create other types of sedimentary rocks that I know you're familiar with, mainly the carbonates, limestone, dolostone, that type of stuff. Now, limestone can form in different ways. Limestone and dolostone are closely related, so I'm just going to talk about limestone. Limestone can form several ways. Now, the limestones I work with are usually siliceous. They have silica in them, and they're Precambrian, so they don't have fossils in them. Right. They form from mostly from chemical precipitation. As seawater, under the right conditions, with the right ions in it, can precipitate out carbonates. That's one way to get a carbonate rock. Now, another way to get a carbonate rock is a bunch of calcium-rich things die at the bottom of the ocean floor. They get mixed up, and you can get a limestone that way. 
and then you know recrystallization happens it's still sedimentary because it's not eating pressure and could become dolostone now you can get dolostone which is dolomite precipitated directly out of seawater but that's very difficult most dolostones we see are altered limestones and then we have coal which is completely organic in nature and i don't have to worry about coal in the precambrian because there are no plants so that's a type of sedimentary rock too. It's an organic type and sometimes limestones. Carbonates are also considered organic origin, like fossil shells, that kind of thing. Talks for other times. And then we have evaporites. Those are things like your halite, table salt, gypsum, stuff that forms as a salty body of water evaporates and that salt remains behind. So you can get sedimentary rocks from chemical weathering too. Now, if these are lithified and buried, they can become involved in the rock cycle just like everything else. So I just didn't want you to think sedimentary rocks were derived from the physical weathering of other, other rocks only. Now they can be formed from the physical weathering of igneous and metamorphic rocks, but sedimentary rocks can also be formed for the physical and chemical weathering of existing sedimentary rock. Another cycle within a cycle. Any rock can be subject to chemical or physical weathering to become detritus or chemically altered rock to eventually become a sedimentary rock. Now, all rocks don't have to go through this process. A melt does not have to become an igneous rock, which doesn't have to become a sedimentary rock, which doesn't have to become a metamorphic rock, all right? Back to igneous. It's not a simple bicycle cycle. The only for sure's is you can only get an igneous rock that crystallizes from a melt. All right, we're not gonna talk about pyroclastic flows. We're not gonna talk about ash beds because there's a joke in geology. Ash is igneous on the way up, sedimentary on the way down, although we consider it igneous, even though you know it came from the sky. It was precipitated from the atmosphere, which brings me to something else that's precipitated from the atmosphere, snow and ice. Ice on earth fits the definition of a mineral, hence ice fits the definition of a rock. And most of us don't really think of it that way or because it melts at a really low temperature and we get water, but it is a sedimentary rock. And you know, we see nice, beautiful pictures of glaciers with all this blue and white ice. And the reality of the thing is they're kind of dirty. They like to pick stuff up and mix it into them as they move. So, you know, ice technically is a sedimentary rock just just keep that in the back of your head and you can't go from metamorphic to igneous without melting first and in order to become a sedimentary rock you know formed from sediments there has to be some sort of existing rock to get that out of that detritus we're talking about plastic rocks a sand is derived from a rock you know you can't get sand unless you have something that has weathered into it and that's one of the reasons why when we pull the trital zircons from sedimentary rock, we don't get the ages of sedimentary rock. We get a maximum age, okay? A detritus or sediment cannot directly become a metamorphic rock. It does need to go through that sedimentary rock process first. Now, a sediment can become rapidly buried, but it's gonna undergo lithification, become that sedimentary rock before it becomes that metamorphic rock. One more quick thing about that is, all these rocks can become melt. Even detritus can become melt, okay? Even though it's not technically a rock for this purpose because melts can move up through the crust and melt and incorporate that rock and sediment as they come through. And if a magma body comes up through the earth and encounters metamorphic rock, it'll melt that and incorporate it. Then sedimentary rock, melt that and incorporate it. And then igneous rock, melt it and incorporate it. And if it gets a sediment at the top, it can melt it and incorporate it. So you see all of these with enough heat we're just gonna deal with the heat part, all right? And not gonna deal with water content or pressure release or anything like that. Can become melt. That's a pretty messy looking cycle, isn't it? It's a lot of sub cycles involved in that. Everything isn't clean. This rock begat that rock, begat that rock. That's not how that works. And you can have it happen quickly or you can have it happen slowly. It just depends on the depositional environment of that rock. 
right? An igneous rock can stay igneous for billions of years. There's examples in the Upper Peninsula of rocks that have remained igneous and are over a billion years old. This is a piece of sodalite rich igneous rock. Let's just leave it there, all right? It's a polished piece I have. It has special properties, but I've talked about these rocks before, so I'm not gonna talk about them again here, but it's igneous and it's been that way for over a billion years. And sedimentary rocks, like this banded iron formation that I've cut and polished, alternating beds of what people call red jasper and mostly hematite, the grays here. There's other minerals involved, but for simplicity purposes, that's what it is. And you can see it has layers. Those layers, or thick laminations in this case, are called beds, bed sets. It's the lamination scale. And that's something I want to touch on real quick. Like if you have a sedimentary rock, you know, with primary structures in it, things like bedding, ripples, or even fossils in it, if it's undergone low-grade metamorphism, what happens is those primary structures are usually preserved. You can still see the ripple marks on Baraboo quartzite, for example. Piece of the Baraboo quartzite, uh, when it's not weathered and iron stained, it's very purple quartzite. This is the only one I have with any ripple marks on it. So you can still see primary structures, and this is a bed, even though it's undergone low-grade metamorphism. As that rock, in this case, we'll just use a sandstone, which becomes a quartzite, undergoes more metamorphism, those structures can be messed with. They start to disappear. At about medium-grade metamorphism, you start to see things like really stretched out ripple marks or really stretched out fossils that have experienced so much stress that they've strained into this elongated shape. We can also see preferred alignment of pebbles and them being altered, crystallization aligning, that kind of stuff. And then by the time you get to high grade metamorphism, the structure's gone. You can't tell anymore. And that's what happens to most rocks. So both like things like mudstones and granites, if they're metamorphosed enough into that high grade, that schist, that nice, they're essentially a schist and a nice. It's really hard to tell that origin. So quick recap, you have your melt. And in this case, our melt cools, becomes an igneous rock. That igneous rock can go one of two ways from there. It can experience erosion and weathering, and it can be become detritus, just sediment or it can undergo heat and pressure but not back to the melting point and become a metamorphic rock. And from there, that metamorphic rock, if exposed to the surface, can become detritus. Now our detritus undergoes lithification, the process of going from sediment to rock, and becomes our sedimentary rock. Now our sedimentary rock can either be re-eroded and become detritus again, or it can become deeply buried and become metamorphic rock. So there's our basic cycle complete. And then any one of these can experience enough heat to melt and become a melt again. Well, except for the melt because the melt's already there, but they can all be melted and be reused to eventually become an igneous rock again. So I think that's it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And I hope you learned something. And sedimentary deposit and and now litho <laughs> but it's not it cools from igneous rock and we can but it becomes oh wait shit sorry <laughs> so okay so I <clears throat> I need that. Ah!